We have gone to extraordinary lengths to ensure that the committees get responses to their legitimate requests. But this is not one. President Biden is apparently afraid for the citizens of this country and everyone to hear those tapes. They obviously confirm what the special counsel has found and would likely cause, I suppose, in his estimation, such alarm with the American people that the president is using all of his power to suppress their release. President Biden is using his executive privilege over audio of his interview with special counsel Robert Herr. This audio is at the center of a Republican effort to hold attorney Merrick Garland in contempt of Congress. Garland advised Biden in a letter Thursday that the audio falls within the scope of executive privilege. And it all comes as two House committees are expected to hold hearings over the contempt effort. Joining us now is The Hill's national political reporter, Julia Manchester. Julia, let's get right into it. The special counsel's report fueled a firestorm over Biden's memory and mental fitness. What political consequences do you see for both the White House and Republican investigators now that this audio won't be made public? Look, for Republican investigators, Margaret, this means, you know, they might have some, you know, they won't have as much evidence, I guess, to point to. You know, they're trying to find essentially something, something that they can back up potential impeachment with. And there was a theory that this could provide them with evidence. And it also comes as they're trying to hold Merrick Garland in contempt of Congress. But at the end of the day, look, this is just something that Republicans will essentially point to and say, you know, look, um, um, you know, this did not, this report didn't paint ba Biden in a flattering light, and this is the White House essentially trying to hide it. However, on the flip side of that, the White House says that this was a way to keep the Department of Justice and the legislative branch separate, that the White House did not have to reveal uh, this audio recording and that it would set a precedent for audio recordings to be released in the future for potentially political purposes. Now, it's important to note that in this, um, you know, during this cross, not cross examination, but during this uh, conversation interview between President Biden and the special counsel, um, the special counsel did not find any reason to charge Biden. Biden did not find that Biden had committed any crimes. It was just the description um, of him struggling with memory, et cetera, that uh, Republicans have really grasped onto. Now, the stage is set for a presidential showdown. With six months left until the election, Trump and Biden will face off at two debates. Julia, walk us through exactly how the deal to debate came together and will they impact the race? Yeah, so this came together very quickly yesterday morning, or I should say on Wednesday morning. Essentially, um, the uh, President Biden's campaign released a video of him challenging Trump to two debates. Then we saw Trump accepted that challenge, and then we saw networks get involved, television networks, so CNN and ABC. We know that CNN will host the first debate on June 27th. That will be aired on CNN and its sister platforms. And then ABC News will host the second debate um, in September. September 10th, and that will be apparently aired outside of ABC as well. So just not not only on ABC Network. So definitely um, a very untraditional way of debate planning because normally we see campaigns and television networks go through the Commission on Presidential Debates. The Commission has been organizing and um, you know essentially putting these debates together going back to 1988. They've really worked as a middleman between all of these um, you know stakeholders holders and presidential debates, but, you know, no more. We saw that the campaigns did this along with TV networks and it was set in stone then. This is certainly an historic rematch. What are both sides hoping to gain here? Look, I think from the Biden campaign's perspective, they want to uh, put President Biden in a light where he can, you know, have a positive performance similar to his State of the Union performance and be able to, you know, tout his accomplishments during his administration and, you know, essentially, um, you know, make himself look better against Trump, maybe look uh, rattle Trump in some way. We know that former President Trump wants to be on a stage with Biden. We know that he obviously preferred to have a bigger audience. These will be in TV 
these studios. There weren't, won't be audiences at th these debates, but um, Trump essentially wants to do the same thing. I think the Trump campaign wants to paint Biden as someone who was slow, old, elderly, not able to keep up with Trump on a debate stage. So I think we're going to see, obviously, like we do in any debate, political debate, you know, shots being fired from both sides. But it's going to be a major test for both of these men who have faced questions, you know, respectively about their own mental acuity and age. Julia, right now we have some prominent Republicans that are crossing party lines to actually support Biden. And we're hearing Nancy Pelosi say she thinks Biden should forgo facing Trump. How are the two parties reacting to the decision to hold these debates? You know, look, I think um, in terms of the Republicans that have come out to support Biden, I don't think there were any major surprises there. I mean, Adam Kinzinger, a former Republican congressman, now he's a commentator on CNN. He's long time been a critic of, you know, former President Trump. And then you have Sarah Matthews, some other former Trump staffers that have spoken out against him. I don't think these are any surprises there. But in terms of, um, you know, how this looks in terms of a debate, I think there is some concern, maybe on both sides of the aisle to an extent, that this could very well go the way of the first presidential debate in 2020 when we saw it essentially devolve into a screaming match between the two candidates. And no one really came out looking good, even though Biden and Trump will both say they respectively won that debate in the second debate. So, you know, I think there's a concern that it won't be productive, that there will be slip ups on either side and that Republicans and Democrats will seize on those slip ups and, um, you know, try to uh, paint the, side, uh, the other side negatively with that. But you know, there's obviously big risk to this. At the same time, though, I think journalists, people in the meet political media view this as a show of transparency. These men are, you know, competing to be one of the most, you know, if not the most powerful person in the world, let alone the United States. So this is a high pressure situation. They'll be put under a bit of a test. Julia, Biden and Trump are hoping to keep the debate stage free of third party candidate RFK Jr. But his campaign is working to make sure he's up there. Any chance he'll qualify? You know, look, if he makes those meets those qualifications, he seems to be suggesting that by June he will have met those qualifications. We'll see. I mean, I don't think Biden or Trump want him on stage, obviously. He's proven in polls to be spoilers to both of them. And they will both want to set this up as a Biden versus Trump rematch. They don't want Kennedy to have this platform and risk getting votes shaved off, essentially, from their respective sides. So, you know, we'll see if Kennedy, in fact, qualifies. For now, it's going to be Biden versus Trump. But Kennedy saying that by June, he could very well have met those qualifications. Julia, as you laid out, Trump and Biden work to bypass the Commission on Presidential Debates, and the two are really debating months earlier than usual on the political calendar. What impact will all this have? You know, in terms of the impact, it's interesting because we saw Biden campaign chairwoman Jenna Malley Dillon essentially say that, you know, having these debates earlier and the commission on presidential debates was pushing more for September, October. That's when traditionally presidential debates have taken place. But she's arguing to have them earlier because we know that voters are voting earlier and voting by mail and that ensuring that a debate happens in June or even September, voters who are choosing to vote early and um, or mail in their ballot will get a chance to view both candidates side by side early enough, as opposed to, you know, some of these late October debates. We've seen in a post-COVID world and other, um, you know, elections and off-year elections, the midterms, um, the primaries, we've seen, you know, an uptick of Americans starting to vote by mail, vote early. So that seems to be the trend we're um, seeing this all go in. And Julia, before these debates, a possible verdict could come down on Trump's hush money trial. The defense is likely to rest after Michael Cohen's testimony. Are Trump's lawyers expected to put up a defense and call witnesses, maybe even Trump himself? You know, it's unclear right now. I would say that a lot of, you know, talking to legal experts and supporters of former President Trump, you know, the prosecution putting calling uh, Michael Cohen up last could play into Trump's defense team's hands. I mean, we're seeing as we speak right now, um, Trump's defense team paint Michael Cohen as someone who was unreliable and challenge him in the courtroom, talking about how he is someone who has lied to Congress and who has served prison time. He's not trustworthy. So, you know, there, I think there's a question as to whether they would need to call an additional witness. It would certainly be a major move if they were to call Trump and a risky one. But I guess anything can happen. But 
um, you know, I think th they want to wrap both sides want to wrap this up as soon as possible. And while they do, Biden is getting ready for the debates. Congressman Jim Clyburn is on a cross-country tour to help Biden shore up his support among black voters in key swing states. And Trump is trying to make inroads with this same group. Are Democrats worried here? Democrats are worried, I think, to an extent. Um, but Jim Clyburn is someone who's always campaigned for Biden to rev up the African-American vote in particular. Remember, in 2020, it wasn't until South Carolina, Clyburn's home state, uh, that where we saw a big boost for uh, Biden in that state and in the Super Tuesday states. So Clyburn has a lot of influence, and I think he would be on the campaign trail for Biden regardless. But there is certainly, um, I think, a fear and anxiety that Biden's coalition might not be 100 percent intact. So Democrats are taking any, any cautionary measure to make sure that coalition is together. Julia, the Supreme Court has put an effort to redraw Louisiana's congressional districts on ice. It's clearing a way that includes majority black districts. How will this new map shape the reelection race for Republican Garrett Graves? You know, to be honest, I haven't looked into this topic as much, but I think in terms of how it, um, you know, help uh, impacts that Republican, I mean, we'll, we'll see if uh, this favors a Republican district or favors a Democratic district. It seems like Louisiana, Louisiana is obviously a right leaning, more conservative state. Um, so we'll see if that, you know, plays into Republicans' hands. And finally, Julia, the corruption trial for Senator Bob Menendez is underway. He's accused of accepting hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of bribes. Menendez has dodged allegations of corruption in the past. So what is coming out of his opening arguments? You know, look, Menendez is essentially saying he's a victim here. Um, he's being targeted because he's a high profile Latino Democrat. Um, and there's a chance that he could uh, point the finger at his wife, uh, Nadine Melend Menendez, in this and essentially accuse her of knowing more than he did. Uh, her trial is taking place separately, but it'll be interesting to see whether he decides to flip on her. The Hills, Julia Manchester and host of What's America Thinking? Julia, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Russian President Vladimir Putin is in China Thursday to meet with Chinese leader Xi Jinping. Ukraine recently rejected proposals from China to end the more than two-year war. The proposals reportedly favored Russia. Russia and China have strengthened ties as both countries face deepening tensions with the U.S. and its allies. Meantime, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken wrapped up a visit to Ukraine earlier this week. Blinken even visited a Kyiv nightclub where he picked up a guitar and led a local band in a rendition of Neil Young's hit, Rockin' in the Free World. The North Carolina State Senate has voted along party lines to ban wearing face masks in public, including for health reasons. Republicans who voted for the ban say that it will help law enforcement crack down on protesters covering their faces. They argue that the demonstrators are abusing COVID-19-era policies amid a rising tide of pro-Palestine protests nationwide. Democrats are pushing back, raising concerns about those who are immunocompromised and want to continue wearing masks for medical treatments, including chemotherapy. The Supreme Court on Thursday upheld the way the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is funded, rejecting a constitutional challenge that could have dismantled the agency. In a win for the Biden administration, the 7-2 ruling rejected an argument brought by payday lenders that the agency's funding system violated constitutional provisions on government spending. The CFPB was set up after the 2008 financial crisis with the goal to regulate mortgages and other consumer products. The case had threatened to not only curtail the power of the CFPB, but possibly disrupt financial markets by casting doubt on other government regulators. Rapper Cardi B is vowing not to vote for Biden or Trump in November. The 31-year-old performer said in an interview with Rolling Stone Thursday that she has felt, quote, layers and layers of disappointment with President Biden after voting for him in 2020. The Grammy Award winner expressed concerns about the cost of living and foreign policy, citing the ongoing situation in Gaza as a flashpoint for her lost support. That's today's Daily Debrief. I'm Margaret Chadbourne. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe to The Hill's YouTube channel. And come back here soon for the intersection between politics and policy.